Well, let me begin by uh, saying good morning. And on behalf of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Polish Institute for International Affairs in partnership with the Center for Eastern Studies in Warsaw and, uh, and the Bertelsmann Foundation. We are delighted to welcome you here to CSIS on a very cold morning. It's wonderful to see so many smiling faces. Uh, probably most of those smiles are frozen uh, in place from when you walk to the metro. Uh, but we are indeed uh, very glad uh, that you are here. My name is Heather Conley. I'm director and senior fellow of the Europe program. And uh, before we begin our program, I, I wanted to take a moment, if, if I could, to pause and reflect on the life of one of America's uh, most distinguished diplomats and statesmen who touched many people in this room, personally and professionally. I, I, ambassador Holbrook was an amazing figure for European security, serving as US ambassador to Germany, assistant secretary of state for European affairs, and certainly 15 years ago today, his historical role in, uh, uh, in the Dayton Peace Accord. And, uh, I, I think uh, we all join uh, in sharing our condolences with Ambassador Holbrook's family, his larger family at the State Department, many of whom are here this morning, uh, as well as our, our broader uh, U.S. government family. And we uh, certainly are very saddened by, by this loss. The idea behind this morning's conversation, this trilateral conversation, We've really looked back over the last year and a half and have seen significant policy movement within the space of, of the transatlantic relationship with Russia. As we near the two-year anniversary, Vice President uh, Biden went to Munich to uh, announce the U.S.-Russia reset policy. We've seen extensive engagement with the German leadership, certainly under uh, Chancellor Merkel's leadership, uh, extensive engagement with the leadership of Russia that touches upon the economic sphere and the security sphere of relations. And clearly, Poland uh, probably has had the most dramatic uh, change in its relationship and its policy towards Russia. Uh, in part, uh, as President Medvedev said last week in Moscow, because of Russia's cleaning up of its historical debris. But I think uh, also uh, this uh, enormous policy shift has occurred because of, uh, quite frankly, um, I think we, someone has a microphone. Do we have a microphone on? Just work. Sure. Um, and certainly because uh, of, of stemming from enormous tragedy following the, the wake of the tragic loss of President Mrs. Kaczynski and uh, over 100 Polish uh, senior officials and dignitaries. So this morning's conversation, uh, and that's very much the idea to have a conversation, which is why we're around a table and not behind a, a panel uh, table, is to capture this extraordinary progress in all three of our government's approach to Russia, but more importantly, to get a sense of what lies ahead. We, and really seeing the incredible progress uh, from the NATO-Russia summit, uh, we're entering a historic moment. And I think uh, the three gentlemen I have with me um, are certainly uh, incredibly well placed to begin our conversation. And I'm joined here this morning by Ambassador Sandy Vershbaugh. Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs at the Department of Defense. I think Ambassador Birschbau is probably one of the most unique senior U.S. officials placed because he's dealt with U.S.-Russia policy from the State Department, the National Security Council, and now the Defense Department. And I think he pro will provide a very unique perspective uh, on, on the U.S.-Russia reset policy. Obviously, this is a, a very important week, uh, potentially, if the Senate uh, begins to consider the New START Treaty. So we're looking forward to Ambassador Vershbaugh giving his sense of the, the reset and, and, and certainly the, the, pro, the policy moving forward. We're also joined by Ambassador Klaus uh, Chariot, uh, the very distinguished Germ, uh, German ambassador here in Washington, known to so many. Another person who has touched European security and defense policy, German security and defense policy uh, for his professional life, serving as state secretary, political director, uh, head of the security and uh, policy department and chef de cabinet to three uh, NATO secretary generals. So we're looking forward, Ambassador Sherriot, to, to your comments. And finally, we are delighted to welcome uh, Ambassador Heinrich Litwin, 
Undersecretary of State in the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, responsibility for Eastern and Consular Affairs. Ambassador Litvin has served as Polish Ambassador to Minsk and has served as well in the Polish Embassy in Moscow as Deputy Chief of Mission. So he has uh, certainly uh, seen the implementation of Polish policy uh, directly in Moscow. So our format is to begin the conversation with Ambassador Wirschbau, turn to Ambassador Sheriot, turn to Ambassador Litvin, very distinguished three ambassadors. Uh, I'm going to pose a question to sort of get the conversation started, and then we welcome you to join us. So with that again, welcome to CSIS. We're glad you're warming up, starting to thaw, and uh, we look forward to a wonderful conversation. With that, I'm going to turn my mic off, and Sandy, turn yours on, and okay. we're ready to get started. Okay, well, thank you very much, Heather. Thanks for the invitation. It's an honor to, uh, to be here today. It's also been an honor to work uh, again, on European security affairs and the Russia relationship uh, during the Obama administration. And I do remember fondly my days working with Dick Holbrook on many of these issues uh, during the, uh, the Clinton administration. And uh, indeed, a, a really towering figure uh, has been lost to all of us. Let me, let me say a few words about uh, our Russia policy and uh, the implications for the broader transatlantic approach to Russia. Uh, at the risk of uh, stating what you've heard before, let me summarize some of the key aspects of the reset. Uh, I think I've often said that the previous administration didn't really have a Russia policy as such. It treated Russia more as a, uh, a function of other issues. And I think that uh, a lot of opportunities were missed as a result. So a key objective of this administration has been to establish a more coherent Russia policy that aims to uh, look for ways to work together on areas of common interest, to try to improve the quality of our dialogue on the most sensitive issues uh, so that we can cooperate wherever we can, but also push back when we, when we must. Uh, we've also worked to uh, integrate Russia more closely into the fabric of the international community, uh, to try to thicken the relationship, uh, to make it more multi-dimensional, uh, and thereby to ensure that uh, parties on all sides have more of a stake in keeping the relationship on a positive track. We think this approach has been useful and it's been fairly successful to date because it uh, helps to better demonstrate our real intentions, uh, to counteract uh, narratives of zero-sum competition, uh, to better delineate areas of, uh, of agreement and dis uh, disagreement, to create more of an infrastructure for collaboration on a wider range of issues, and also, we've sought to reform existing structures, such, such as the NATO-Russia Council, the OSCE. That one's not going as well as the former. Uh, so that we can address new security challenges. Uh, our approach is based on a sense of confidence that we can uh, cooperate with the Russian government uh, without checking our values at the door and without compromising our relationships uh, with countries that have had or continue to have uh, difficult relationships uh, with Russia, uh, countries such as Georgia, uh, to name just one particular example. Uh, clearly, we came into office with a very toxic relationship, uh, particularly after the, uh, the events of August 2008. Uh, but I think we have done a, a lot to detoxify a, uh, a very challenging relationship. And, and we've had a positive impact on a number of key areas. Uh, the most obvious examples are Afghanistan, strategic arms control, and Iran. Uh, but uh, we don't want to rest on our laurels. Uh, these are all important issues, but we want to continue to broaden the areas of cooperation uh, with missile defense, an area we, we think of tremendous opportunity, conventional arms control, uh, both of which are very important for the uh, future European security agenda. Uh, Clearly, one of the key outcomes of the reset was the New START Treaty. Uh, you know what, what it contains in terms of significant reductions, a comprehensive verification regime, uh, at the same time giving both sides flexibility to protect their security, uh, including for us and for the Russians, the freedom to deploy ballistic missile defenses. We were very pleased at the Lisbon summit, above and beyond the uh, impressive array of deliverables that we achieved there. Uh, we we're also pleased by the, uh, the strong support for New START by our uh, European allies, and especially the, the Central European allies. Foreign Minister Sikorsky probably had the most 
heavily praised op-ed in the, in the history of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, uh, but it was a good, but it was a strong and timely uh, uh, message about how the New START Treaty was very much in the interest of Central Europe, countering narratives here that, that the reset and the New START Treaty uh, in particular were somehow being pursued at the expense of our allies in Europe. And I think you know, the au contraire was the message not only from, uh, from uh, Minister Sikorsky, but from many other uh, leaders uh, during the summit and afterwards. So we, we are hopeful that within the coming days the treaty will be ratified and uh, soon thereafter we want to pursue follow-on talks uh, aimed at further reductions and we want to bring in uh, non-strategic weapons as well as non-deployed weapons uh, into the discussion. Uh, and I think this is going to be an important subject uh, for NATO to take up uh, following up on the tasking at the uh, Lisbon Summit for a, a posture review that's supposed to address both uh, the, the right mix of conventional missile defense and nuclear forces and also the arms control dimension of alliance strategy. On Afghanistan, uh, also a, an impressive uh, uh, record of progress with the Russians since the reset. Uh, at Lisbon, some important decisions were taken, including uh, the Russian agreement to help us uh, help us help the Afghans build their helicopter fleet, uh, which is heavily dependent on the Russian MI-17. Uh, the Russians agreed to contribute spare parts and training, uh, maintenance, uh, and there'll be a trust fund set up to this end. We expanded on ongoing counter-narcotics cooperation programs, and perhaps most importantly, the Russians agreed to uh, further expansion of the northern distribution uh, network which, uh, as, as you know, offers us alternatives to the more vulnerable routes through Pakistan. Iran is perhaps the most dramatic area uh, where we've seen uh, progress under the reset. Uh, and we've been working closely with the Russians and with European allies uh, trying to uh, achieve the goal of preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapons capability. Uh, the Russians, of course, worked closely with us on the original Tehran research reactor proposal, which could have at least uh, created greater confidence uh, until the Iranians walked away from it. Uh, as it became clear, we needed to move to the pressure track. The Russians worked closely with us on Resolution 1929, which imposed the, uh, the strictest sanctions yet on Iran. And I think going beyond what they needed to do, the Russians not only suspended uh, the delivery of the S-300, but they actually, in a very public and demonstrative way, canceled the contract I think to send a clear message to Tehran that Russia was, was fully aligned with the, the rest of the P5 plus one and in insisting uh, that Iran take the steps necessary to reassure the international community that it was going to keep its nuclear program strictly peaceful. I mentioned some future areas for cooperation. Uh, conventional arms control is one where we're hoping to, uh, in the coming months, to reach agreement on a framework for negotiations aimed at uh, resuscitating conventional arms control, modernizing the, uh, the CFE regime. And uh, any such framework has to uh, be consistent with certain key principles, including principles of reciprocity when it comes to transparency and reductions. Uh, we want to seek reciprocal restraints on concentrations of heavy forces and uh, permanent basing in sensitive regions. And we will insist on a renewed commitment to uh, respecting key international principles, such as respect for uh, internationally recognized borders and the principle of host nation consent for the stationing of foreign forces on anybody's territory. Finally, I mentioned missile defense as uh, an area where we saw important progress at Lisbon, not only in NATO's very important decision to uh, adopt missile defense, territorial missile defense, as a, as a mission for the alliance, <clears throat> but also positive signals from President Medvedev of an interest in uh, collaborating uh, with NATO on missile defense, an agreement to a resumption of theater missile defense cooperation, uh, further discussions to look at broader issues, including territorial missile defense, ways we can link up NATO's uh, developing system and Russia's missile defense assets in a way that could both could enhance both of our uh, uh, security. So this is a 
you know, we're, we're not there yet on missile defense. There's still a lot of Russian skepticism about our phased adaptive approach and about this, the degree to which we're ready to engage in cooperation. Um, but I uh, am I'm optimistic that this could become not only a fruitful area of cooperation, but even a potential game changer in the, uh, the U.S.-Russian and the NATO-Russian uh, relationships. So to conclude, we've made a lot of progress on the reset, still some sensitive issues uh, to, to tackle, still a lot of suspicions and uh, misconceptions uh, about U.S. intentions and U.S. Uh, goals. Uh, on the Russian side that we need to dispel. But I think we now have a very positive dynamic and a very constructive framework for dialogue on even the most difficult issues. Uh, and I think the support for this approach that we saw at Lisbon in terms of uh, the Allies' call for a true strategic partnership with Russia, which is now reflected in the new strategic concept, uh, suggests that uh, at least uh, on the transatlantic side, we're uh, very much in alignment in terms of what we want to achieve, and I think by working together, we're more likely to succeed. Thank you, Ambassador Snell. Dr. Turner, please. Thank you, Heather. Thank you very much for, for having me, and I also think this is a very innovative format, uh, so I appreciate that. I think if uh, the US, Poland, and Germany work together on Russia, we can achieve quite a lot. Now, uh, John Maynard Keynes has once said, the difficulty is not really developing new ideas, the difficulty is escaping old ones. And I halfly, half agree, I think really that is the biggest challenge is to get away from old stereotypes, but of course we also need new concepts, so he's only half right. Uh, I don't think we need any WikiLeaks to, to uh, prove that uh, in the past we did not always agree uh, on, on Russia. But I think that time is over. I really believe that since the reset policy of the Obama administration, our three countries are really pushing for the same thing. And I believe that the reset policy which we have supported Germany from the very beginning is uh, having great results. Uh, Sandy mentioned already uh, New START. You mentioned already transit to Afghanistan. But especially, I think Iran should not be underestimated. I think without the reset policy, we would not have had a changed position. We would not have had strong sanctions in the UN Security Council. So I think that shouldn't be overlooked. Now, you will allow me to say a word for New START. Uh, we in Germany really believe this needs to be ratified. It would be, it is a very good treaty. I think it has verification, it has uh, cuts. I think it uh, played a huge role in having, in creating a different mood. And therefore, I think if that would not be ratified, that would be a setback, I believe, for the relationship between the West and, uh, and Russia. And therefore, I very much hope that this does not take place, because if it would not be ratified, we would have probably uh, obstacles to much of what you said, to CFE negotiations, to talks with the Russians about further cuts, also uh, talks about uh, non-substrategic uh, nuclear weapons. We would have problems with Iran. We would have problems with transit to uh, Afghanistan, maybe even in the Middle East. I mean, you would see quite a few problems. And I think you would also weaken the forces of change in Russia. And that, I think, is a very, very important point, which we shouldn't overlook. Because let's not forget, in Russia, there is a situation where you have different forces. Some have realized that the future of Russia could only be in a kind of a very close relationship with the West, where they also get something from us. We, of course, would get something from them. I come to that in a minute. But uh, I believe that this is uh, interesting music, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think. Uh, 
this would be very important. Therefore, I really hope that uh, New START will be ratified. I think, uh, and here I come to you, I think that uh, also Germany and Poland have done in the last few years many good things together. I, I think of the visit, of the common visit of our two foreign ministers to Ukraine in June 2009. I think of uh, the visit to Belarus uh, just a few weeks ago. But I also think of initiatives like, for instance, the seminars uh, done together by our two uh, policy planning staffs and the Russian policy planning staff, where they talked about uh, World War II, views of history. And I think really that this reset policy has set off also a totally different mood. I find it, I not only cut in what happened there, I find very uh, positive. I also find it positive that now the president of Latvia will go to Russia for three days for a very long visit. All this is, is new. And let's not, uh, let's not forget that. Now, the future. I believe in the future we have particularly four areas where I see huge potential. And Sandy has already touched on three of them. The first, of course, is the NATO-Russia Council. And I'm very happy with the result in Lisbon. I think it was a very good summit. And we got this language in the security, in the new strategic concept that the security of uh, NATO and Russia are intertwined. I think it's a very important formulation. And I believe that the biggest of all the good results of Lisbon, good strategic concept, good thing on Afghanistan, many, many good results, but the best might be the relaunching of the NATO-Russia Council. Because the NATO-Russia Council, in my view, is an instrument which is very, very good, but has not been fully used yet. And I think Lisbon opens the door to a full use of the NATO-Russia Council. That's my first point, NATO-Russia Council. My second point, and you touched on that already, Sandy, is missile defense. I believe that this could really, as you said, a game changer. Why a game changer? Because it could mean that we have a common security space in a very important area, and it could mean that we get into a totally different paradigm on security with Russia. And therefore, I think of all the things, this is, I think, very, very, very important and a huge possibility. I'm very happy that we do this common threat analysis. I'm very happy about the work we, we are doing these days. Of course, there are difficulties. There are major difficulties. I'm fully aware of that. It will not be easy, but I think we are well advised if we would put a lot of concentration on that. My third point is conventional arms control, CFE. Um, I think we need to talk about that. It is a huge positive, uh, I think, for everyone. It is a potential win-win. It's not easy. I, again, I know that there are difficulties, but I think with the reset policy and if we get a ratification of new start, I believe there is a chance to get that. My last and maybe the most important point of all is modernization. Why do I say that? Because that, again, I think could make all the difference. Uh, let me just go back. This is a German invention. We invented some two and a half years ago uh, what we called at the time a modernization partnership with Russia. Now, why, do we, why did we do that? Uh, we did it because we believed the only change you can uh, get in a country is from within. You can't ever change a country from the outside. You can only ch change it from the inside. And therefore, if we want to have different forces in being powerful in Russia, we need to give those forces who want, to, who want change, who want reform, we have to empower them. And how can we do that? By training, by education, by also things like rule of law, training. I mean, there are many, many things. Uh, energy security. I mean, there are many, many issues. And we introduced this idea uh, some two and a half years ago. And 
I believe that it really strengthens also the hands of Medvedev, uh, who is uh, maybe a little bit more uh, leaning towards reform than others. That's one thing. And we are very happy that the EU then one and a half years later embraced that idea too. And I think that in addition to these three other things, which I mentioned, NATO Russia Council, missile defense, and uh, CFE, this modernization partnership with Russia could be a game changer. And again, I believe it would be great if especially the United States, Poland, and Germany would work together on that. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, ladies and gentlemen. It's, of course, a uh, great pleasure for me uh, to have this opportunity to present you Polish perspective, not only on uh, NATO-Russia uh, cooperation, but also uh, uh, European Union-Russia uh, cooperation. Uh, it won't be, of course, uh, a general Polish vision. I'm only uh, let's say, uh, um, bilateral uh, diplomat of uh, medium-sized European <coughs> country. And I would uh, um, only mention uh, maybe three elements of these relations uh, which uh, I consider important uh, and which uh, from our Polish may be very particular point of view are interesting. Um, now let's start uh, with so-called uh, Polish-Russian historical dialogue. Mm. We should underscore that uh, Russian uh, uh, gestures uh, linked with the December visit of uh, um, President uh, Medvedev are very important. The first is uh, handling over significant uh, number of Katyn's crime investigation files. Uh, the second uh, is the State Duma declaration on uh, Katyn's massacre, condemning explicitly and clearly uh, Stalinist totalitarianism as a criminal system. Uh, public opinion uh, in Poland mostly appreciate these uh, gestures. We perceive it as a symbol of the, of the new Russian um, approach to both uh, dramatic history of Polish-Russian uh, relations and the uh, Russian attempt to cope with uh, their own uh, traumatic uh, history, traumatic past. And one should not underestimate uh, the drama initiative. In Poland we hope it will be a stimulus to sincere uh, historical debate um, in Russia that enables the, this, this great country to uh, re-evaluate uh, its history and establish solid moral and political foundation uh, for further development in both uh, internal and external dimensions. Uh, this is, of course, in well understood interest of Poland and uh, its uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, allies for Russia to cope with that challenge successfully. Uh, in our belief in Poland, this process will be uh, lasting and difficult. Mm, we fully understand it. Mm, and we will expect the, the effects uh, with, with patience. But it is encouraging that the, uh, the process uh, has started. So let's underscore once again the importance of Russian official and clear condemnation of uh, Stalinist totali totalitarianism. Without this, uh, without this declaration, I think would be impossible to introduce a genuine mutual trust into Russia's uh, relations with the transatlantic uh, community. The second, uh, second element is modernization. Um, in my conviction, Russian leadership has definitely embarked on a difficult but pr promising process of modernization. Uh, however ambitious uh, Russian uh, plans uh, um, still require final, uh, final definition. Uh, as far as its priorities are concerned, whether this uh, will be more about uh, technology, 
uh, or rather about efficient state of law. According to the mm, transformation, transformation experience of Poland, what paves the way to the modernization success are workable institutions of the state of law. Uh, yes, uh, their very existence uh, clarifies the rules of any public activity in practice, proving their uh, relevance and necessity for mm, everyday life of citizens. What sounds uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, trivial in the West uh, is not uh, uh, very uh, um, much obvious in Russia because of its uh, uh, very special experience from Soviet times when institutions worked against citizens. But let's talk about, about positive experience of uh, uh, Polish-Russian cooperation um, for modernization. In uh, that context, uh, we consider new Polish-Russian uh, gas supply agreement, uh, the first uh, so far successful test for uh, Russia's will of modernization. The new agreement um, and the new contract with Gazprom prove that um, energy relationships uh, with this difficult partner, difficult till now, uh, can be fixed as uh, fully suitable for uh, the uh, provisions of the energy char charter. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, flexibility of uh, destination clauses and, um, and uh, take or pay principles uh, in, this, in this agreement. This is in fact a new guiding precedent for another, another European energy partners of Russia to be, to be followed. Another area of cooperation uh, hopeful area of cooperation is Kaliningrad Oblast. Since a few months uh, together with uh, our uh, Russian partners and, and of course European Commission, we are working on a prospect of uh, local border traffic uh, agreement for Kaliningrad um, Oblast and, and corresponding territories of uh, two Poland voyevod ships, uh, Gdańsk and, and uh, Olsztyn. If we succeed in uh, our efforts, the aforementioned region mm, uh, can be transformed into selected test fields for new solution in free movement of people between, between Russia and the EU to be pursued within uh, the uh, Partnership for, for Modernization framework. Uh, our major goal is, uh, in this respect is to create uh, mm, relevant opportunities of equal Russian citizens to learn more about, uh, about the real life uh, behind the EU borderline uh, and in the country uh, at the stage of, uh, we hope, successful transformation and also to acquire practical experience of personal relationships with the people of the EU and, of course, their institutions. Uh, the third element is the special role of, of uh, uh, countries from uh, Eastern Partnership Zone. Uh, development of more advanced relations between Russia and both NATO and the EU requires also new definition of Russia's attitudes towards both in institutions' cooperation uh, with the group of states located in their common neighborhood with Russia members of, of Eastern Partnership. Currently, those countries are signific significantly uh, differentiated uh, due to variety of <coughs> factors such as democratic and human uh, rights standards, economic standing, willingness and abilities to integrate into international structures. In the context of modernization, uh, more exactly, in the context of uh, partnership of, for modernization. It seems to be a paradox that uh, while some of the uh, aforementioned countries are deeply engaged in the EU uh, EAP uh, programs, they subsequently drive attention of uh, conservative circles uh, in Russia, followed by political claims of special, special uh, uh, interest or so. 
To my respect, it needs to be admitted that uh, this traditional uh, Russian approach to the European security and, and stability could create serious obstacles for um, modernization and cooperation with the West. Uh, in my opinion, both Russia's strategic partners, NATO and EU, shall use the opportunity facilitated by the transatlantic reset uh, and mastermind their common strategy with Russia to end up with this paradoxical situation uh, rather sooner than later. Otherwise, negative dynamic of common problems may undercut a still fragile uh, positive one of common solution. F uh, uh, simply speaking, if partnership for modernization, modernization with EU is good for Russia, similar approach uh, of Ukraine, Moldova or, or Georgia uh, shouldn't be uh, considered in Kremlin as an anti-Russian action. Uh, the processes of modernization and cooperation with EU and NATO uh, in whole Eastern neighborhood of you should develop parallelly and, and harmoniously. And uh, conclusions. Today Russia seems to be determined to develop more pragmatic and cooperative relationships with both NATO and EU. Still one has to keep in mind that Russian military doctrine uh, and some uh, procedures uh, practiced by the military forces of that country, for example, last year exercises in Belarus, uh, keep their traditional course. Also, the way um, the Russian authorities responded to NATO proposal for, of the establishment of the missile defense system in cooperation with, with Russia evokes, evokes some, some particular concerns. So, uh, one can put the question whether exist two Russias or dual uh, dual Russia or dual uh, nature of Russia's uh, uh, modernization concept. In any case, uh, we consider that we, I mean Poland, consider that uh, um, a likelihood of vital compromise on many issues with Russia today is much higher than ever. And, uh, and our obligation is to, to use this opportunity. So, uh, uh, we remain careful, but we look for new effective areas of cooperation. Uh, certain part of Polish public opinion remain distrustful, but we will continue Polish-Russian historical dialogue. Uh, we are attentively observing the, the changes in the Russian military doctrine and uh, the military exercises near our border. But we support NATO-Russia uh, missile defense project and cooperation in the field of reduction of middle and short-range missiles in Europe. Medvedev's visit to Warsaw has awakened certain hopes in Poland. It brought about a definitely new kind of, uh, of atmosphere between Russia and Poland. President Medvedev has endorsed a modern code of bilateral communication as well. All the aforementioned gestures shall be seen um, as a symbol of more general tendency in Russia. We believe that uh, the fact that Russia, uh, president, uh, Russia's president stayed uh, in Warsaw on his way to Brussels <coughs> can be perceived as a guiding line for further, further reset uh, of Russia's uh, modernization, modernization ambitions. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. That was a, a comprehensive overview. I agree, Ambassador Chariot. Uh, I love this format, uh, U.S., Poland, German conversation on many issues, uh, and certainly on this one. I, I think we've renamed a policy this morning my friends, it's the transatlantic reset. And, and I think this is uh, very much uh, part, of that, uh, part of that conversation. We have about 10 or 12 minutes for uh, some questions and, and some dialogue ourselves with you, the audience. I, I'd like to, uh, to begin by posing to all three of you 
uh, two questions. And, and I think we've really, it, it's incredibly impressive, uh, the list of issues and how far we have come in the last two years on, on a variety of issues, historic to arms control, Iran, Afghanistan. But what concerns me, and, and I think the Obama administration has been uh, you know, understandably clear that part of the success of this policy has been delinking it from more difficult issues. And uh, Ambassador Vershba, you, you alluded to the, uh, you know, the unsuccessful OSCE summit, which talks about the values of the Helsinki principles. So help us understand, now that we've had wild success, and I, I put that in, in, uh, in this policy, how do we turn now to the tough issues where we haven't seen progress? And I think that touches on the CFE question, host nation consent, that talks about why we haven't moved farther on Russia uh, implementing the EU ceasefire uh, agreements in Georgia. Uh, it's not to take away from the incredible success, but it's how do we turn that success into those issues that are also critical to, to values. And then my second question, and Ambassador Sherry, you, I think, very well said that how, does, how do all of these policies help support, I think you use your words, strengthen the hand of President Medvedev? And as we look at 2012 and the dynamism uh, that will be uh, uh, within Russia, how does this policy, does the transatlantic reset get caught up in some struggles of the traditionalists versus perhaps the reformers, or do we strengthen one but to our detriment? So I, I maybe a, a sense of the internal uh, dynamics. So Ambassador Bushra, why don't I have you, and then what I'd like to do is turn this and we'll bundle some questions and then have the panel uh, respond to those. So please. Okay. You have to turn on well, your we, mic. Well, we've, we've uh, we made a conscious decision to avoid uh, a linkage strategy. Uh, recognize that there's always limits on how far you can go in, in the broader relationship if there are you know, serious issues that uh, energize uh, important constituencies who, uh, uh, you know, whether it's human rights groups or those who are concerned about uh, sharp business practices in Russia making it hard to invest. So. All, you know, you, one can't completely separate issues, but we felt that under the reset, uh, tackling issues on their merits, trying to find areas of cooperation where our interests at least overlap if they don't coincide completely, can produce tangible dividends that benefit our security and, uh, and contribute to more momentum on tackling the tougher issues. But, uh, you know, the hard part lies ahead. Uh, I think the OSC summit itself was disappointing, but I think it also set the stage for progress in the future because we stood firm on, on, on key principles, uh, you know, particularly the importance of OSCE continuing to be a vehicle for addressing the, the, the frozen conflicts and not sweeping those under the carpet or using such vague diplomatic language that uh, the role of OSCE would be, would be weakened. So we had to sacrifice an action plan that we would hope to achieve, but we're going to continue to work on that action plan after Astana. Uh, and also build on, on the good declaration that was issued, the commemorative declaration that did reaffirm all the, the fundamental uh, Helsinki principles and, uh, and some, some key principles for the future. I, I think the same approach will ultimately yield dividends on CFE, where again, the aftermath of the events of 2008 makes it complicated on how to uh, come up with a framework that uh, is consistent with the essential principle of host nation consent within internationally recognized borders, which is our position. Uh, but I think we will succeed in the coming months in reaching agreement on a framework. Actually, translating the framework into, an act, into a concrete agreement is going to be the real hard part. So uh, we know we have our work cut out for us, but uh, I think having a common transatlantic uh, fr uh, foundation on which we're trying to build uh, gives us at least uh, reasonable chances uh, for success. Uh, and I would just say on your second question, I'll leave it to others, but uh, certainly our approach is, is underpinned by the notion of, of trying to encourage and promote forces for, for constructive change in Russia, uh, using the, the infrastructure of our binational uh, presidential <laughs> commission to, uh, to engage with more elements of Russian civil society as well as with the government. Uh, and to uh, promote 
more transparency and, and exchange of ideas and, and, and people uh, so that over time uh, the modernization agenda being advanced by the Russian leadership can, can gain some, uh, some momentum and irreversibility. I believe the policy of no linkage <laughs> was correct. Um, I believe that um, it's always easy to concentrate on that which separates you. And of course, with Russia, there are many issues. I mean, whenever the chancellor or the foreign minister goes to Moscow or some other place in Russia, they have, of course, talks about uh, human rights, about the rule of law, and they meet with Memorial and others, which is not always fully appreciated uh, by the hosts. And that, I think, of course, n needs to continue. But I think the decision of the Obama administration to concentrate on what can be done, on the doable first, I think is absolutely right. And when you say, Heather, now how do we get to the tough issues? My response is already those four which I mentioned are tough. Uh, I think, you see, to really make the NATO-Russia Council a forum of strategic dialogue and of joint action is not easy. We tried in 97, I still remember that. It was called at the time the Permanent Joint Council. We tried again a bit later, and all this was, was good, but it has not fully reached uh, the goals yet, which we had in mind when we created it in 97. And also on missile defense, I would warn that this is already done yet, or this is all easy. This will be exceedingly different. Difficult because when you look at the details, there are uh, quite a few differences, and I think it will will use a lot of uh, it will need a lot of ingenuity and creativity creativity to bridge those gaps and to get to move forward. And missile defense, you already mentioned, host nation consent will be very difficult. But even on modernization, I believe. There are really, and you refer to that, there are different perceptions. You know, do we just exchange technology? That's not our view. Of course, we include that. But as I said before, we would like to strengthen, of course, with the consent of Russia, we like to strengthen those who are forces of reform, who, because we believe if those forces would uh, have a better position, a stronger position, that would be good for all of us. So my antithesis to yours is the so-called easy issues are very tough. And we don't really need to, to, uh, to find that. But the key thing, and I repeat that again, the key thing is whatever we, be, we, whatever we do, we should also always never forget what does this do internally to the situation in Russia. Does this strengthen forces of reform? Does it weaken it? Does it get us back to where we used to be? Which I believe is neither in the Russian nor in <coughs> our interest. So that for me is the key question. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's very, very interesting format for discussion, but, but we should remember that uh, there are three, uh, 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 three various partners, very big, big and, and medium-sized one. <laughs> so one can say that, that um, two medium our, size our, <laughs> Don't yourself. Two medium our size. goal, <laughs> our Polish goal, <laughs> uh, is uh, to, uh, uh, not to be obstacle. Uh, but I think uh, we can be also quite uh, interesting uh, uh, instrument uh, uh, how to check the, the, the Russian openness for, for cooperation. If we talk in general uh, about, about uh, the dialogue, I think uh, this is our Polish experience. The very important thing is to maintain the dialogue. Uh, mm, so no, no uh, uh, straight linkages. Uh, the, the most important thing is to, to maintain the dialogue very open um, and uh, uh, of course, very important is to repeat uh, the uh, general uh, general position concerning standards, but at the same time to be open for for Russian proposals. 
uh, this uh, give us the, the hope and uh, and the, the possibility to to final uh, a very very positive effect. <coughs> time of our, our panel, so I'd like to take absolutely one question, my, my apologies for that, and then allow you to answer, and then we're going to end very promptly. So, uh, Martine, if you want to just, again, keeping it very short, short question and keeping our answer brief. Two, two, two. Just one. one. Just one. Two. 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 Okay. Two. 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 Well, <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> I have two questions indeed. I mean, first on my <laughs> 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 Okay, I just, I just stick to, to the one. Um, that'll be to Ambassador Verzhbov and the one I will choose. Um, which is, I mean, w we obviously, we, we're talking a lot about missile defense here and we were talking about it yesterday too. And I think that we are increasingly under the impression that the future of, of reset will really uh, depend on um, whether we get an agreement there or not. Uh, and in that context, I wanted to ask to what extent is the US prepared to accommodate Russian perspective on the issue? I'm Jerry Livingston from the German Historical Institute. My question, a precise one, goes to Ambassador Bershaw also. Um, I also have a favorite uh, op-ed by uh, Radek Sikorsky, the foreign minister of uh, Poland, and it appeared in The Economist about two weeks ago, and he writes the following. America no longer fears that a European defense identity would undermine NATO. On the contrary, America would positively welcome a European Union with better organized and more robust defense capabilities. Indeed, given the defense cuts, which the United States must inevitably make, we should be prepared for the day when Europe has to take care of its own security, at least on its own periphery. So my precise question to you is, would the United States welcome more robust European defense community? Uh, and on the periphery obviously means uh, on east, in the eastern and central part of Europe. Uh, let me take the second question first. Uh, we certainly, uh, I think, have gotten past our ideological hang-ups about the European security and defense identity of, uh, of the 1990s, and we certainly do uh, support any effort that can bring more capability, more uh, political readiness to, to act on the part of our European allies. This is not uh, so that we can uh, hand over responsibility. I think our interests in in European security are, are enduring, and uh, this, this is a partnership uh, definitely for, the f f f for the f not only the near term, but for the, the very long term. But I think that uh, seeing Europe uh, take more responsibility is, uh, is, a, is a something that would only be healthy for the, for the transatlantic alliance in the long term, recognizing that we all face uh, an ever, ever expanding array of challenges around the globe. Uh, we look for a stronger European partner to deal with challenges outside of Europe and not just in Europe or on the periphery of Europe. Uh, so uh, uh, even though we have all, uh, we all have to deal with financial pressures, I think we need to think of how to achieve more capability uh, with the resources we have through more pooling arrangements, through uh, better prioritization by retiring the forces that are really more relevant to Cold War challenges and focusing on those capabilities that deal with the, with the future risks. And I think the NATO summit sets a framework for doing just that, including a stronger NATO-EU relationship, and I hope we can capitalize on that. On missile defense, uh, I wouldn't want to say that the whole reset hinges on achieving cooperation on missile defense, but I do think that, as Klaus indicated, if we can succeed in this, the implications would be quite far-reaching because it would demonstrate to those naysayers who re really believe that our, our interests are, are ultimately incompatible, that NATO and Russia, the United States and Russia, can join forces to deal with a major and growing threat, the threat of ballistic missile proliferation and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And that's why I think it could be a game changer just in the sense of showing that we can move beyond modest but useful forms of cooperation to something that really affects the existential security of NATO countries and of Russia. 
Uh, NATO has adopted a strategy and has endorsed the U.S. phased adaptive approach as, uh, as, as a key U.S. contribution to a NATO-wide architecture. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, we have fixed ideas on how we can work together with Russia to enhance our common security. You know, Russia has its own missile defense uh, assets in being, as well as programs for, for new generations. So I think the challenge is to see how can we work together so that NATO can help Russia better defend itself against ballistic missile attack, where are the areas where Russia's capabilities could improve the effectiveness of NATO's system as, as it's going to develop. Uh, can we carry out joint exercises so that we can work up uh, common plans, rules of engagement, so that we're actually prepared to deal with a, an actual crisis scenario where decision making is going to be almost instantaneous. So the more we've worked out in advance, the more likely we will be able to, to meet a threat to our respective security together. So uh, yes, you know, we, we have a, an architecture that uh, NATO has, has decided to develop, but I think that we're very open to ways that our architecture and Russia's systems, both today's and tomorrow's, can be linked together uh, to mutual benefit. Yeah, I very much agree with what Sandy just said. I think missile defense is not the only issue, but I think it's, it's a, as you said in the beginning, a game changer. Because if we could really make that work, that would be terrific. And let me just recall that we did already have cooperation on theater missile defense with the Russians. And if I might just add one thought to, I subscribe to everything you said, Sandy, but I think if we could do missile defense in the NATO-Russia Council, that would be the win-win-win. If we could mm -hmm. really give the NATO-Russia Council an operational uh, task and uh, do this together with Russia, I think we would have a totally different uh, security re relationship and a totally different security situation in Europe. So I agree with that. On ESDP, uh, I still remember the, the, first, uh, the first conversations in 1997. And again, WikiLeaks will tell you later on, we were not always in full agreement. And, uh, but I must say, this is very uh, heartening to see how this has changed. I think today this is no issue anymore. And I think uh, the Europeans and the Americans are exactly on the same line. We are singing from the exactly the same sheet. Um, I think successful operations of ESDP like Congo and others where the United States couldn't or didn't want to intervene, I think they helped, of course. And I think by now, this is, in, and I, I, I'm absolutely sure of that, this is no longer an issue. And uh, I think that's very uh, comforting. The one thing which still is an issue is uh, the EU-NATO relationship. And there I'm less content than on ESDP uh, for reasons which are, I mean, that's the next topic. Uh, but <laughs> it's really a next topic. But there I think we could really need some improvement. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our colleagues.